propulsion, the future of propulsion. So I appreciate you all taking the time. Um, I'm Mark Wakefield. I run the automotive practice of Alex Partners. For those of us, those of you who have not worked with us, we're a global consulting firm. We've, uh, we've got 2,500 people around the world. We're founded in automotive. Uh, do a lot of other things now at the, uh, as well, but have been around this space for quite some time. We're an experience-based approach, so we've got, on average, 20 years' experience of, of my whole team. Um, and so it means we're a little more participative than, uh, than most consulting firms and deliver in a bit of a different way. Um, we have a great panel here of a few different people I'm going to introduce in a, in a few seconds. I wanted to set the stage a bit with, with a few things first. So if you go to the next page. Um, about eight years ago, uh, my firm coined the term case, uh, connected, autonomous, shared mobility, and electrified. And we did it to say that, to basically force the discussion to say things are changing in a revolutionary way, not an evolutionary way. And so the old value chain of the OEM at the center dominating everything is not really how things are going to go forward, especially in these new environments. And so we really think that, that this panel represents a good ecosystem of all the players that have to come together, but come together and participate in one way rather than dominate the chain. If you can go to the next page. Um, we're here talking about electrification predominantly. And really, this, this, this world has changed dramatically in the last 18 months. So if you look on the left-hand side, all of the different OEMs and countries that have declared they're going to be fully electric by a certain date, it's an amazing amount of, of, uh, of people. If you put those all, said all of that's going to happen, you would get to a 35% BEV share by 2030. Uh, our forecast is a little lower than that globally, but it's, it's still an astonishing change, sea change, really in the last 18 months. You can also see that on the, on the right-hand side, where each year for the last several years, we've looked at in the last five years, in the next five years, what are the announced investments in electrification, electric vehicles? And you can see hovering around 200 billion. It's about the amount that the whole industry spends in R&D and CapEx in one year. And then this last year, it shot up to 330. And next year, it's going to be even higher. A 41% jump in the amount of money people are planning to spend. And that's only the beginning. So really, this is why it's so important to now talk about the future of electrification. Go to the next page. And we haven't talked so much about the future because the costs have generally been too high. You know, 8,000 to 11,000 right now has a difference, we believe, in, in a BEV versus an ICE. But that is changing fast. You know, this curve on the right, if I put it back a few years, would have been above $1,000. Uh, and it's come down dramatically fast. You can see the OEMs that have their announcements out in the future as to where it goes. And I'm sure they're all counting on Denise to, to come through to, to make, that, make that happen. Um, but LG's done a fantastic job so far. Um, and this really enables um, the democratization of electrification and makes it a serious thing for OEMs and suppliers and something that can't be ignored. So you go to the next page. So I wanted to, uh, to have that as a, a backdrop um, for each of these speakers talking about their piece of this ecosystem and how their companies are, are really charging aspirationally into this new world. So first, it's Harry Husted from Berg Warner. He's the CTO. Uh, we have then Darren Post, who's the head of engineering for Lordstown Motors. And then we have Denise Gray, uh, who's the president of LG, Solution, LG Energy Solution Michigan. Um, LG for short, I think I'll say. Um, and then Mike Chapins, who's the head of global supply chain from Nikola. Um, so without further ado, Harry, I invite you up to make your remarks. Good afternoon. So I'm just getting the clicker. I had to find that. So I've got three slides I wanted to show you, and I'd just like to introduce Borg Warner as a company and uh, what we've been doing, who we are, and where we're headed so that you have some perspective as we talk further about this space. So as a company, our vision is a clean, energy-efficient world, 
and our mission is delivering innovative and sustainable mobility solutions. Now that's a new mission for us. We've kind of broadened that and we've um, moved from a more balanced approach to really this focus on sustainability and mobility. So as a company, we're uh, 50,000 people strong, uh, very global, and about $10 billion last year in 2020. We have 96 locations and 23 different countries, so really spread and pretty well balanced uh, around the world as a company. One thing we announced back in March to the investor community um, is a project and an initiative we call Charging Forward. And it's got three main elements, and that are to profitably scale our um, electric light vehicle business, to expand into electric commercial vehicles, and then optimize our combustion portfolio. And so when you talk about the small e in those first two, it's really a focus on pure electric vehicles. And so that's a, a big um, commitment by us and a, and a big focus. And that's accompanied by this chart on the right-hand side of the page, which really shows what we want to do in this space in terms of our company's revenue. So this is not our prediction of what the market's going to do. This is our um, commitment or our goal of what we've put for ourselves in terms of the percentage of our sales in this space, and it's specifically around electric vehicles. So uh, it's a very focused objective for us, and you can see pretty big numbers out there in 2030 to have 45% of our revenue be in pure electric vehicles. But really exciting, and it represents a, a great opportunity and a great challenge for the company in the transition. But we've been laying the groundwork for this for a while, so I want to show you the progression we've taken in a very deliberate way in looking at our electrification portfolio. And as we look at this, you also get a better feel for where we play in this space. So back in 2015, uh, we acquired an integrated company called Remi, and with that brought in the traction electric motors that create the torque and power that move the vehicle. Then in 17, we acquired a company called Sevcon, which brought in industrial focused power electronics. In 18 and 19, we brought together two smaller companies, um, Reinhardt Motion, AM Racing, and formed a small company called Cascadia Motion, which gives propulsion solutions um, at the front end of the development process very quickly and efficiently. In 2019, we announced a joint venture um, with Romeo Power. And then in 2020, we acquired and integrated a company called Delphi Technologies, which is a propulsion-focused spin-off of the old Delphi Automotive Systems. And with that, that brought into Borg Warner um, a couple important things. Brought a lot of scale and strength in electronics, and particularly in power electronics. And that includes the inverter, which drives the electric motor. That's DC-DC converters, and that's onboard chargers, so those key pieces of an electrified vehicle system, in addition to a very large software team. So this added a lot of electronics and software to the company. And lastly, this year we announced um, a very uh, big acquisition of a battery pack company called Akasol, which we're working through right now. But that's exciting because that brings, you know, another... Um, linkage into the battery pack space here. So now if you can think about an electric propulsion system, um, as a company we've really brought in major components uh, of an electric propulsion system into the company to position us to take us toward our goal in this charging forward initiative that we've announced. So that's an overview of the company and that gives you perspective of where we're coming from uh, as Borg Warner. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Darren Post. I'm the Vice President of Engineer of Lordstown Motors. I'm going to give you a little bit overview of what we're doing. Uh, we're developing an EV pickup for the fleet and commercial market. We're doing something quite different here where we're using hub motor technology, which is a revolutionary approach to providing four-wheel drive to the vehicle and meeting what we need to do, which is a low cost of ownership that fleet and commercial customers want. We've spent time with those customers and, and have taken a lot of input to make the vehicle more operational and more usable for them as they meet that, that goal. 
Now this vehicle is a beta vehicle. We built that at our facility. We designed it from the ground up. We'll go a little bit further into that in the next several slides. So I, I envision where we are with EVs is a, is a revolution in the market. If you back at the turn of the century, you had the carriage builders who didn't really want to change. They had a lot of infrastructure. They really were happy with what they had. You had the, you had the, uh, the, the automakers with the little putt-putts that the carriage makers wanted to go away. And we're the EV company that's that little putt-putt company that's innovating, and we're open to try the things that the big carriage builders may not be willing to try. So again, we're, we're willing to look for good solutions that advance the uh, range, the cost of ownership of an, an electric vehicle with, with any key collaboration with the key suppliers. So we're leveraging a plan of the past, and we're building the vehicle of the future. So if you look at our, our site, areas that used to build up, let's say, engines and transmission assemblies have now been replaced with hub motor uh, manufacturing areas and battery pack manufacturing areas. So this is helping us uh, as we transform our, our business to manage our cost and quality of those components moving forward. So we've innovated at, a, I'd say, a breakneck speed. You know, starting with the hub motor, the hub motor actually is, there's only four moving parts in the vehicle for propulsion other than coolant pumps. There's one on each corner. It's powered by uh, the high voltage battery through inverters to each motor. And that's it. And it, it can generate the equivalent of our vehicle is equivalent 600 horsepower. Now, a lot of fleet and commercial, we listen to them. They want us to provide abilities to limit speed, limit acceleration, because guess what? We have instantaneous torque. We have instantaneous traction. So we're, we're, we are doing those types of things, including o OTA, over-the-air controls and, and monitoring. So we went from, we've optimized our skateboard so that it, that it incorporates the four hub motors, and then we've optimized for crash. So we've done a lot of CAE work to make sure that we can meet our FMVSS requirements, and we've optimized the, uh, the, the whole architecture around the hub motor, and then we built our first betas this spring. So now we take those first betas, and what's so exciting about it is we then, we actually crashed our vehicles and we met FMVSS requirements the first time out. So we did that this spring and into the summer or into June. If you look on the, on the, the right, we've, we've established very good, I'd say incredible CAE capabilities, which has led our design. And that predictive model on the, on the left, that's, that's how we, uh, that we envisioned it. And that's how it really came out when we actually did the crash test uh, at, at one of the proving grounds where we did that. So this has allowed us to meet all the FMVSS requirements early. Uh, this is enabling us to get to market. It helps us really our speed to market. So we're very excited about this. Um, it, it's, a, it's an accomplishment that uh, it's really propelling us forward. Now this is a technology um, maturation curve. And I would say that most of the EV components are in that kind of new and pacing technology area. It feels a little bit like the turn of the century. Everybody had a different alternator. I pulled a picture up and it had all the alternators back then. Everybody, some had alternators, some didn't. Spark plugs were different orientations and sizes. Guess what? The customer doesn't need all the, the, the non-customer facing things. I think it's time that we need to standardize some components, and we're willing to work together to do that on the EV components. And we would also like to collaborate on the other components on the mature side of it as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a ground, it's really a perfect time in the industry to do this. Uh, as we look forward, you know, we're looking forward to doing other vehicles, and we want to incorporate some of those innovations working with collaboration with suppliers and other companies uh, along the way. So thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Denise Gray, and as mentioned, I'm a part of LG Energy Solution Michigan Tech Center. 
Um, the name keeps changing and therefore we kind of keep changing the slides to keep up with, uh, with LG changing. But LG is changing because the industry's pool for battery systems continue to grow. In fact, uh, in the next couple of years, by the middle of this decade, uh, we'll be adding additional manufacturing facilities here in the U.S. to bring our capacity up to over 100 uh, gigawatt hours in order to support the, the vast number of suppliers and customers that we have here in the United States. But that also couples with what we're doing globally. In fact, when we first started manufacturing batteries, it was back in Korea uh, a number of decades ago. And then um, at the turn of 2010, 2012, um, LG provided a facility here in the United States with support of the U.S. government. Um, the Recovery Act of 2009 actually provided uh, a 50-50 cost share to bring battery manufacturing to the United States. And many of you in the audience, uh, you here on the podium, have been recipients of that support from our federal government. Um, recently, um, the 100-day uh, report also with uh, the bipartisan um, uh, bill is trying to push forward to do more of that here in the United States. And quite frankly, um, that is needed in order to be able to realize that 100 uh, gigawatt hours of capacity here in the United States just for our automakers and suppliers here. Um, we are probably in third right now here in the United States with capacity around the world. Um, China, Europe is uh, leading the capacity for batteries for LG, but we're really, really excited about what's going to happen in the next couple of years with a $4.5 billion um, investment commitment to the United States to add two more additional battery plants here outside of the joint venture that we have with General Motors that's also adding capacity here in the United States. So I am extremely excited because I think about 10, 12 years ago, we didn't have any manufacturing facilities in the United States for batteries by LG. Uh, and I was here at, uh, at, at CAR talking about the plan to increase, to bring the manufacturing here to the States. And a decade later, it's here and it's growing. And so it is with great excitement um, that we do say that here in the States, we are increasing that capacity. That capacity will not just be for automotive, it'll also be for stationary. And so, quite frankly, as we looked at the cost curves that my colleagues on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the uh, stand here presented, that cost curve is going to be realized because of the synergies with stationary as well as automotive, because we do think it all fits in together. Additionally, as more and more of the automakers pull for battery technology, um, LG, Energy Solution, as well as my other colleagues in the, in the battery world are continuing to bring the technology here. But we can only do that if we act together. We act together with solutions that allow us to continue to bring safety, anti-propagation solutions to the industry, how we can continue to bring remanufacturing and reuse and recycling of the materials that we bring. And that collaborative uh, technology or collaborative work uh, is allowing us, I think, to reach that 2020, uh, 2030 uh, guideline of well below $100 per kilowatt hour, and also to ensure that we just don't put these batteries that still has capacity left in them, that after the useful life in a vehicle, we don't want them to end up in a landfill. That is irresponsible by all of us. And so we all have work to do in that area around remanufacturing or reuse of the batteries as well as recycling. Last but not least, we continue to advance the technology from the battery cell itself and the technology that's going to go into that. I listened to one of my colleagues doing lunchtime, QuantumScape, as they continue to evaluate and innovate. And we're all rooting for them because again, together in the industry, will we 
uh, solve some of these, uh, I these issues. And last but not least, as we talk about the vehicles, and again, nobody buys a vehicle because of a battery. I grew up in a vehicle company, and people buy, ba buy vehicles because of the wonderful looks of those vehicles. It pulls on the heartstrings of a consumer to buy the vehicle. And so I am rooting for those automakers who are creating and putting all of their energies into creating the most beautiful vehicles that are wonderful to drive. And so that is the reason why people will buy the vehicles, not because of a great battery. So with that, we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Denise. Uh, we really look forward to that capacity as well on, on the OEM side. So, so thank you all for bringing that um, uh, to the market. What and who is Nikola? Uh, Nikola, we make electric and hydrogen fuel cell semi-trucks. And we support those with fueling stations that will encompass and contribute to those, those vehicles, making it from point A to point B. The Class 8 trucks that we are uh, now uh, producing prototypes for and will have trucks on the road at the end of the year are our, our tray bed semi-trucks, which is battery electric. We have our tray fuel cell electric semi-truck in the middle. And then on the far top right, that is our two fuel cell. And the, the unique thing that, that Nikola brings to the market is we cover all the areas, from short to medium to long haul, which is, is a unique place to be in. But to even add more to it on the bottom is we encompass that with a fueling network where we will produce hydrogen, distribute hydrogen, and fill up the trucks with the hydrogen. Now I've told you, now I want to show you. So I'll sit down and I want to I share a video that our team put together for you all. Thank you. Heavy commercial transportation is one of the biggest emitters of carbon on the planet. And it also happens to be the fastest growing in recent years with e-commerce driving increased traffic around the world. That's a big problem for zero emissions. We need to be able to move heavy things long distances without polluting the planet. So we decided to do something about it. There's enough uh, energy in uh, one kilo of hydrogen to equal three kilos about of diesel. It's the only thing I know of that, that beats fossil fuels. The only question is how much is it gonna cost you? Because hydrogen historically has been expensive, but we're gonna change that. We combine the transportation and the energy piece together. And I think that's what makes us novel, is because we have an integrated solution for customers, both on the vehicle and the energy supply required to make that happen. To enhance adoption of fuel cell trucks, you gotta make sure that you have ecosystem in place, but ultimately to compete on highway solutions, we have to be able to deliver fuel at parity with diesel and we have a very creative solutions how we can accomplish that. If you start to look at, very precisely, the things that have been coming out of this company, you see the sequence. The energy collaboration that we announced in Europe, the dealer network to provide service for those products as they become available, an APS rate in Arizona that makes the production of low-cost hydrogen feasible, the energy infrastructure required for these vehicles to get charged or, or get their hydrogen fueling. And now, all of a sudden, this strategy becomes a strategy that, hey, you can execute on this because these pieces are coming to fruition. The next six months are an acceleration of what you saw in maybe the last month. And we do have production prototypes of a incredible battery-powered electric semi-truck, 750 kilowatts on board. We have some here in Arizona working in Europe, Upper Peninsula of Michigan in the last few weeks doing winter testing. All of that work will culminate this summer in a fully validated and tested vehicle that will go into production in September. Right hot on the heels of that, a fuel cell truck built on that platform that can go far distances with heavy loads using hydrogen. We have production facilities coming online in both Europe and the United States. It's just incredible what is going on here. 
And you think, how does a relatively small group of people accomplish that? Well, we don't do it alone. You know, what's fascinating is that we have a very diverse group of individuals. We have people from all over the world and at very high level. Ultimately, we need that diversity because problems that we're trying to solve is incredibly complex. Each piece of the puzzle that we are trying to build together and each building block is going to take a lot of brain power. We understand the task front of us. It is a difficult journey. Anytime anything of true value has been done by mankind, there's been tremendous challenges that make it difficult to succeed. We understood that going in, we still do, and we are all about overcoming them. We need a different way to power our lives, and Nicholas got a vision for solving that challenge in a way that can be permanent and sustainable forever. We are at the forefront in terms of disruption for the commercial vehicle space. We are decarbonizing the world. And when I think about that vision, that gets me excited. I am proud, proud of what we've done so far, but more excited about what we have yet to do because we are more likely to succeed than we ever have been. There's only one way to move, and that's forward. You know, the industry needs these solutions and we're working hard and we're working with urgency. So the journey is only at the beginning. Okay, do we have room? Is there feedback on this? Can people hear me okay? All right, great. Um, so we're going to have a, a, a bit of a Q&A now, so I appreciate everyone putting their questions in. Um, we'll have the, the screen up so you can see uh, who's who. But I wanted to start, I guess I'll start uh, in the order here. So uh, Harry, um, it's interesting you're sort of between Denise on a uh, a lower tier and, and more uh, base material, and then two new OEMs that are that are buying these components. And I noticed you just announced this big, uh, a new big order for your integrated motor and inverter for a Chinese OEM. How do you see that going forward in terms of, is it going to be guys like you in a tier one that's supplying the integrated propulsion system? Is it the OEMs who want to keep people busy? Um, or is it more of a collaboration than down into the tiers? How do you see that going forward? That's a great question. I think what we're seeing is it, it really plays out OEM by OEM how that goes. Um, each, as we look around the world, we, we deal with, with OEMs globally. Um, each of them has a unique situation, and as they look at that situation, um, they come to us and really tell us what they need, what they want to do. In some cases, we have um, an OEM that wants to move quickly. They want to buy that entire assembly, and we can bring the thing fully integrated. We can engineer the whole thing to their requirements. So we're bringing you know, the inverter, the motor, the gear reduction, all the associated equipment so that's all in one unit. It delivers, and, and it's an easy install. In other cases, they want specific technologies for us from us that are leading edge. Let's say an 800-volt silicon carbide inverter and they want to pair that with um, parts that they're bringing that fit into their manufacturing footprint and their strategy as they transition globally from being engine focused to being electric motor and BEV focused. Okay, very good, thank you. So Denise, since the panel has been announced, I've been eager to ask you this question. <laughs> what is the, do you think is the current market price for uh, a full pack or a battery cell on a kilowatt per hour, and where does that go in 2025? Excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> we joked about he has to ask that question, right? And in order for me not to be um, looking for a job at one of your companies, I'll have to quote from our USABC. And I just wanted to kind of keep putting that plug in. Um, 
the United States uh, Department of Energy created the United States uh, Advanced Battery Consortium, and it's a combination of GM, Ford, Chrysler, the U.S. companies working with the government as they develop technology. They also develop cost roadmaps, and that's why I wanted to go there, because I really do think it's a, an asset to you all to know that this information is available. It's freely, you can just Google it, it's there. And it talks about um, the requirements for batteries as all the OEMs have gotten together and really come together to talk about where is the requirements roadmap as well as the cost roadmap. It even, I think, has a model in there on where the cost are in the battery. So it's a great resource to you, by the way. And so I can quote them because I won't get fired if I quote the USABC. Uh, so in 2020, the cost per kilowatt hour was quoted or targeted at about $125 for 2020. For 2020. And uh, for 2025, I think the, the number is somewhere around um, $75 is what the target is. And I repeat, it's a target. It doesn't say that we can actually meet those numbers, but it's a target. And I like targets, right? You know, you aim for the, you know, for the sky, you may fall at the rooftop or the treetop, but it gives, um, I think, the industry uh, a place to go as we're all looking at innovation. So I think somewhere between what the USABC quoted, 125 and 75 in the 2025 time frame is really where we all are, are trying to be. They're assuming that if the battery price is less than $100 per kilowatt hour, it puts it on the, the cost parity or price parity to the internal combustion engine. And that's where, from the OEM's perspective, um, we're not putting the consumer or the business owners at a, com a competitive disadvantage if they offer electric vehicles. So we're all really striving to be less than $100 per kilowatt hour uh, with some target pricing out there, which is tough, you know, around, you know, that, that $70, $85, somewhere down that, down that path. Okay, very good, thank you. I mean, as, as an when I was an engineer in the 90s in the auto industry, the things of hydrogen and, and in-wheel motors and and you know, integrated e-axles were always way far out there. And it's really neat that, that you guys are all bringing those to market. I, I want to ask, let's I guess start with you, Mike, on hydrogen and, and the balance of what does hydrogen work for, what do batteries work for, and how does Nikola think about uh, its future and, and braving that new world, being the first real commercial scale hydrogen powered uh, OEM? Sure, great question. And we get asked that a lot. One of the things is, as I showed in my earlier slides is the, is the full infrastructure that we bring to support these, these vehicles. And we really have three different ways of doing that. We, we have the mobile, uh, the fixed, as well as the, the feed. So for the mobile side, when, as these trucks roll out, we will support them with mobile uh, battery charging solutions. We'll support them with mobile uh, hydrogen fuel cell uh, charging solutions. And then we'll move into fixed. And the fixed will be actually the station. So we'll have uh, battery electric uh, charging for our BEV trucks. We'll have hydrogen fuel cell charging for our fuel cell trucks at these stations. And these will all be fed by a hub and spoke hydrogen production, distribution, and filling of these vehicles. So it is a brave new world. We're hitting uh, three different th uh, things at the same time. We know that's a challenge, and we are up for the, up for the game. All right, very interesting. And the hub orders is another really interesting one. Where, you know, so Darren, how did your team get comfortable with the unsprung weight, the durability, the, the newness of that kind of reach? Yeah, the hub motor decision was was not. It was a very one that's very calculated. What we did, uh, we found that the technology had advanced from one of our key our key suppliers uh, partners to a point where it had the durability to meet, let's say, class two, class three capabilities, um, and it was designed to a very high standard to, from an automotive perspective. Uh, the durability from looking at the different tests, it could take the hub motor can take 100 G hits. 
consecutively every 20 seconds. So we became convinced uh, of its durability, uh, had been tested in very tough, um, uh, hot, cold, dust conditions. And so we, we saw all that and I said the efficiency also was very good. We made that decision. So it, it, it's, it's enabled us to move forward. Um, our, our technology suppliers had over a million kilometers of on-road testing, which we've reviewed. And all of our, the component level testing on the bench, we've reviewed, and of course, we're doing the same testing as well. Uh, we're convinced that we will deliver a vehicle that would have su superior cost of ownership and, and durability. Um, I think the one thing that, uh, just to clarify what the hub motor is, the hub motor actually connects through a traditional bearing into the knuckle. So the hub motor, the motor, the wheel still carries to the bearing into, into the vehicle. So the, the motor won't ever see those particular Gs because actually the wheel would break before that point. But the goal is, you know, we have the durability. What we have learned is we have applied lessons learned from, uh, from our technology partners. And the issue isn't, the hub motors won't fail. It's the connections. The connections are the things that can move around with the suspension as it's moving up and down and as the vehicle is turning. So we've done some innovation working with some key partners, uh, companies like Amphenol, who are leaders in connection, connected uh, um, high voltage connection systems to implement a bus bar system. And a bus bar comes off the motor and brings and presents the flexible wire away from, I call the, the busy part of the, of the system where it's turning and things can, can bounce up from the road. And so, so we're addressing that particular area uh, with that potential failure mode with the bus bar system. So we feel very confident uh, in, in the solution. And um, again, this is something that's gonna change the industry in many ways. Um, the other part of it, just one other part of the, of the hub motor, it actually, is, it, it actually encompasses a traditional brake. So it's got a traditional rotor, a traditional caliper. So, so the innovation is around, let's say, traditional hardened technology for automotive, and we're bringing forth a propulsion technology that won't fail. All right, very interesting, exciting to see. It must be exciting also, Harry, to see this in two worlds, in the traditionals moving as fast, you know, that 330 billion, um, and these startups also braving the new world. As a supplier into these, how do you, how do you face off against these startups that are willing to do hub motors, do hydrogen, uh, as well as the traditionals that are putting big, big bets into um, their BEVs and their EVs? Well, we, we stay in touch with, with technologies as they're emerging. You know, we're, we're, you know, have a team that's, that's keeping watch and looking at what the emerging technologies are, what the startups are doing. And then we're also looking out into our customer community, looking at what they're asking for, what they're receiving, and, you know, willing to accept and try and balance there so that we're making really good business decisions for, for the benefit of the business and going, you know, where the, the, the business is that's going to support our goals going into the future. So it is a balancing act, though, and there's a lot of innovation out there. If you look in the startup community and you look at the fast movers, there's a lot going on, and we're, we're looking at that, and in cases we're jumping in and participating with them where it, where it makes sense for us. That's great to hear. And Denise, speaking of big bets, the <laughs> It's been amazing to see what LG has been willing to do, uh, first jumping in on the Bolt, and then uh, you're seeing these Ultium plants and other plants going up around the world, the joint ventures with Magna and others. Um, it's it, seemingly there's, there's nothing in that space that LG is not really interested in getting into. So how do you make these decisions on these big bets of putting a plant in, and how do you decide to do what's ready now versus to wait or build for the future. So you mentioned the solid state. You know, the, there's other aspects of, of progression that you always are waiting for. Excellent question. You know, um, LG Group is a big conglomerate with many different 
uh, business units uh, with many different um, levels of, of ownership by LG Group. So a, a big con conglomerate, it really is. From I mean, my mother still thinks that I work on washing machines. She can't quite realize that there's other uh, elements of, of, of LG. Um, but I would say in the LG Chem area, which is where my focus has been over the last um, 15 years, as I've worked with them uh, from different angles of the table for battery systems, one element of LG Chem and now LG Energy Solution that I really appreciate, and it's around the dedication to see, to have a vision, and to go after it, even though many say it can't be done. And they go after it because they've got a lot of research. I mean, they're spending a ton of money uh, working on research in battery systems uh, from the consumer uh, devices um, and then bridging those into other markets like automotive. And so when I first became acquainted with LG back in 2006, we had been working with them, I was at an OEM, and through USABC, we'd been working with them on lithium ion back then, back in the 2006, and we had enough evidence based on the work that we did collectively, the OEMs and LG, to say that lithium ion was ready for automotive applications. But we proceeded cautiously, but yet we proceeded. We kept moving forward, and I think that's a part of the uh, the culture of the company that allows it to continue to evaluate the different businesses and to uh, keep moving forward because they have that that um, the baseline in the science. Uh, it's a chemical company, if you will, so it understands it and understands where it can go, but it's it does it in collaboration with the OEMs. Um, uh, and I, I was on it, one of those OEMs at the time that worked very intently to make sure that it wasn't just a technology for technology's sake, but it was uh, integrated with what the automobile industry was needing. And then we moved forward together. And I think that is a part of the heritage of the company. Um, it is a company that tries to, again, um, have a vision and is dead set on staying on that road uh, with evidence from its OEM partners um, that we're on that right road and we continue to evaluate and uh, evolve, as you mentioned earlier, it's an evolution to evolve the technologies, be it in the battery world, be it um, for, for automotive, for stationary, for consumer, and it, I think that DNA bodes well in the other business units as well. Any more big plants to uh, announce today, then? Not today, <laughs> but hopefully by the end of this year, um, again, two more plants outside of the Altium activities. Um, the company plans to try to make some commitments for the United States uh, before the end of this year to meet all of our customer demands. <laughs> Very good. And so, Mike, I want to ask you almost the flip side of Harry's question, where you know, how do you guys think, as a new OEM, you've got must have a lot of supply chain challenges, like all OEMs are trying to figure out right at the moment, but the make-buy, the do I take a new player forward, do I go to the traditional supply base, how do you think about that equation within Nikola? Wow, um, Mark, for uh, challenges for a startup, EV, uh, FCEV, fueling station company, I would, it would take me like eight hours uh, to go through those, those challenges, but the ones that are immediately in front of us today are, you know, the, the elephants in the room are battery cells and integrated circuits. You know, we, we have a need for, for those parts. You know, we um, are looking at every possible way, just like all the other OEMs are, you know, your traditional OEMs are in the same situation as us, but keep in mind, we're small. Um, our, our needs are much smaller than what, what some of those guys need. But that is the immediate um, um, uh, shortage and challenge we run into. Also, another challenge is from, the, you know, I'm in supply chain, so I'll talk to the suppliers when, when I say this. The supply chain uh, need is for the suppliers to look at us with a different business case. We don't make sense. You know, startups, EV companies don't make sense traditionally uh, when you do your business case for us. 
you know, we're low volume, it's going to take us a long time to get to high volume. Also, we will need you more, and we'll need you all to step up, and we're, in many cases, we're not going to tell you all what to do, you're going to tell us what to do, because you will have a lot more resources than we have. So formulating that business case specific to, uh, to a Lordstown, to a Nikola, is very important. And to be honest with you, not a lot of the supply debt base is doing that, but the ones that are, are thriving. And a couple of them are up here on stage with us. So, so I, that's, that's a challenge and also a recommendation. Um, another thing is, is to, to target your customers. Know that your EV customers are, are different and we're not competitors necessarily. I'll take Arizona as an example. In the Phoenix area of Arizona, we have everyone from Electromechanica making a three-wheel city car to Lucid making a passenger car to Atlas making a pickup truck to Nikola making uh, Class 8 semi-trucks. So very different business cases, very targeted approaches should be taken uh, to, to address us and our specific needs. But those are some of the challenges that we have is trying to get you know, the suppliers to look at us a little differently and a little more engaging. Okay. And uh, Mike mentioned the fueling and the fueling side of, of Nikola. Um, Darren, how is Lordstown dealing with the charging aspect and the, the infrastructure element of what's needed for your trucks to be successful? So the first thing we did was we, we did decide to adopt the J1772 um, charging with CS1 type, uh, type CS1 type uh, interface and to go after DC fast charging. It seemed that in the level two and the DC fast charging, that would allow, at least in the beginning, fleets can actually implement those and try have, let's say, the beginning of their own infrastructure. Um, and the other part of it is the, the level two chargers are available for drivers when they go home or and, and they want to, a lot of them bring their vehicles home overnight and they could charge and bring them back. But it is something that needs to change. Uh, we need a, a wider infrastructure. Um, at first with fleet and commercial, it tends to be uh, like a, a utility companies and municipal fleets that use pickups. For example, their, their typical daily routes are under 100 miles. But that's gonna, there needs, there's also needs for greater than 100 miles, and that's where it becomes, when it's 200, 300, 400, 500, that's where we need to have more, let's say, available public infrastructure. Uh, we think adopting the new standards that we are doing and also the new ISO standards will continue to open up our accessibility. Uh, we are talking with different actual charge companies right now to try to, to incorporate potential um, like apps in our in our vehicle that would be predictive of, of range and be able to identify to uh, the, the, the user it's either time to come back to a depot or find a charging charging point but um, again overall um, the way we're starting a lot of the the initial customers will will be providing infrastructure within their system um, obviously this it's important to have greater support, I think, at a, let's say, more of a government level or incentive level to actually grow the infrastructure overall for EVs to, to actually um, actually grow at a much greater rate. I think the other part of it is um, this is more of a, the kind of the, the type of people that be driving our vehicles are, they're not Tesla millionaires and they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're average everyday people. And I think once they see the utility of the vehicle, they're going to become. They're going to start to demand. Hey, why can't I have better infrastructure? What? Why do I have to pay all this money? If, you know, to have infrastructure for my other vehicles. Um, so I think it'll open up a like a more of a real demand. They're going to say, Wow, this has a great utility. Um, it costs a lot less to operate these vehicles. I think it'll create demand. Maybe back to the utilities. Back to let's say the producers of various EVSEs to uh, move forward. Okay, great. And Harry, I mean, hearing just the degree of ambition and reach that's going on in these, and hearing your plan for 45% of your sales getting from, from full BEVs, that's got to be a challenge. How do you manage the, the people in the company and the difference between the, you know, that's not the haves and the have-nots, but the people who still have to do the other 55% of that and the people who are 
getting foosball tables and and fruit at lunch and and you know dreaming of the new things and creating the new things. How do you balance these two worlds of of ICE and EV as as a company like Borg Warner moves along that journey? Yeah, it it is a balancing act it, because if you think back to that chart, what the chart showed was right now we're at we're at three percent Bev content selling. So we have 97% of the team that's working on those other traditional things or engineering out for the things that are coming. So I think we're approaching it very carefully and very deliberately to balance those existing products we have while investing in the new ones and then starting to turn the teams as the, the work changes, as we have more electri electric electrification work to reskill and shift those people in that direction so that the whole team can participate going forward because we don't want to leave team members behind as we, we move forward. It's really important as we make that shift uh, and especially as we as aspire. And I'll also say having been in the electrification side, um, you know, doing some of the power electronics and things like that, there's, there's a lot of demand out there. There's a lot going on. And, you know, we didn't have time to play ping pong <laughs> and foosball, <laughs> unfortunately. It was really, it's, yeah. it's a very, very busy space. And um, so, but it, you know, it is a real balancing act. So okay. thanks, that's a good question. Very good. And Denise, um, we hear these plans for the new plants. The new plants are coming in. What about the raw materials? Um, and how do we avoid building these plants, but having, uh, I think uh, Axios called it, of moving from depending on foreign oil to depending on foreign materials for batteries. Um, how do we avoid that situation, particularly in the U.S., and even given the investments we see in China and Europe? No, excellent question. In fact, lots of dialogue happening these days on how do we, I think, the supply chain resilience, I think, is some of the, the phrases that are happening. Um, you know, I think I remember back when I was, uh, when we first tried to bring battery manufacturing to the states, and uh, the discussion was how do we make sure that we've got access to batteries and not have to always. Uh, fly them in or send them on a slow boat to the United States. And that was our big charge back in, you know, the mid-2000s all the way to, to the end of 2010. And so we started, and that's my point here, we started. And we started by bringing battery manufacturing here, and not just LG, but many of the other uh, suppliers as well. And it was a collaboration with the federal government, the state government, the local governments, uh, universities, as well as um, the, 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 the various companies to kind of come together and figure out how to do it. And we did it back in the 2010, 12 time frame. We did. We made the inroads to bring manufacturing here. We did it at, for LG at a cell level as well as a pack level because we've got many suppliers and some just want a battery cell. Others want a module, which is a group of cells, and some of them want the full battery pack solution. And so at our facility in Holland, Michigan, we're able to do all three of them for whatever the suppliers would want. Now, a decade later, we're talking about how to, and, and back then, I also have to say, we also did a lot of discussion on supply chain resiliency back in the day, back a decade ago, and it was, there was an attempt for that to be a part of the Recovery Act of 2009, that we actually had some material suppliers in that list. Um, we didn't, as a country, as a, you know, just as a country here, we didn't make a lot of inroads there. But now, here's 2021, we're pushing harder in that area. And as we talk about LG adding capacity here in the United States, um, again, two more additional um, manufacturing facilities through 2025, we're also talking about bringing our suppliers here as well. And um, that discussion is going on. In fact, as we look at where we might uh, facilitate those uh, locations, we're looking at 
locations to also add more technology parks, if you will, if you can think of that from perspective, where we'd have some of those um, suppliers that supply to us also in that same facility vicinity. So we are talking about that. We're trying to pull uh, more suppliers uh, of our, uh, our tiered suppliers with us here on U.S. soil uh, as well. Um, and we are also partnering outside of the country with some of those companies uh, to ensure that we can secure supply for those raw materials, um, the processing for so that we can, in, in, in full confidence, talk to our customers and say, yes, we will be able to supply you with the battery cell or the battery module or the battery pack. So lots of discussion in that area, lots of work to be done, but uh, we are encouraging um, with support and really you know, uh, pushing and urging of our U.S. government to really bring on the supply base, the supply chain to the United States as well. And again, it won't be all of it. Of course, it'll never be all of it. But we do have to have some so that we can secure supply. Okay. Well, that's very good. It's, it's certainly a challenge in front of us um, and uniquely in the U.S. versus some of the industrial policy that's, that's gotten um, ahead of us in, in China to a degree. The other raw material is people. Um, and so I'm curious to hear the, I guess Darren and, and Harry, your views on how do we attract and get the right people wanting to get into electrification, into the guts of automotive, but a guts that should be a fantastic new world, I mean, hydrogen fuel cell trucks in wheel motors, integrated e-axles. Um, I'll start with you, Harry. I guess what's, what do you think is the unlock for getting more people excited about joining Borg Warner to electrify 45% of your sales? Well, I, I think it is an exciting feel. I think part of the message that, you know, that we need to get out as Borg Warner is this transition we're making and all the electrification content that we're bringing in, the fact that we do electronics now, we do software, we do batteries, right? That's different than the company was 10 years ago. Um, I also think that, you know, on the, on, as far as the talent pipeline go, you know, STEM education, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, you know, we need to start early and continue to emphasize that. Um, to make sure that there are that our young people, students getting excited about those disciplines and getting grounded in it early so that when they come out, they look at what's going on in the automotive industry. You know, there's a ton of innovation. There's some really cool stuff happening. And if you have that baseline, then when you look at this field, you're going to be attracted to it. You will. And, you know, one of my personal favorites, having been a mentor for a number of years, I really like the FIRST Robotics program because that gets, engages students at a younger age and gets them involved both hands-on and mentally engaged in doing things very early. Um, so that's, uh, that's my view on it. Okay. And Darren, what about you? So interesting, uh, a lot of our, most of our leaders in, in engineering have both big OEM and small EV experience. And as we recruit, the younger people see that. And they're like, wow, it, you know, maybe I have an opportunity that they went there and it's innovative and it's a high empowerment. It's a high, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very different type of environment. And uh, we've been finding that uh, younger people, they see that also, of course, we're a startup as well. There's, there's an ability for the, them to do more. They don't have to be a release engineer just doing one thing for 10 years before they move to the next and the next. So they are able to come in and they can, they can broaden, they can go from the full release to validation to invention to, to the actual concept on a vehicle that they can't do in maybe, let's say, a larger company. But they also are interested in actually the environment. We're finding that we're, there, there's definitely a change in the current uh, graduates from engineering schools, I'm focusing on engineering, but it's true with uh, supplier quality, purchasing buyers, it's, a, it's, it's affecting everyone. They want, they want to go to a company that's actually, they believe is doing something that's really going to hit the environment, really not, miss. not miss it down the road and maybe, you know, we'll, 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 you know we're gonna, we're, we have the philosophy we're not doing, but it's actually going to make a difference. And I think that's changing as well. So. We've had very good success. Uh, 
with um, college graduates coming out. A lot of times interns, will, will, they'll join as interns, we'll have interns in the last year, let's say junior, senior interns, they want to see what it's like. And we've been having, let's say, two-year, three-year OEM uh, uh, coming to our company, looking for that change, wanting to be part of this, this, uh, this evolution, revolution in the industry. That's very interesting. Well, thank you all very much for participating in this. So Mike Chaffins from Nicola, thank you. Denise Gray from LG, thank you. Darren Post from Lordstown, thank you. And Harry Houston from Borg Warner, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for participating.